Good morning or good day to you. Um, welcome to part three of this Ang Anglo-Catholic primer, which, in which I'm going step by step um, through the Mass, at least as we celebrate it here at St. Barnabas Church. Last video, we looked at the introductory rite. It was a long video, I remember, including the gathering, the Kyrie and the Gloria, and uh, the colic for the day. Today I'm going to concentrate on uh, what follows from that introductory rite. The, at least the first part of that section of the service, which we tend to call the Liturgy of the Word. If you remember from last time, I explained that that Liturgy of the Word, this first part of the service, is, um, has its roots uh, in the Jewish uh, synagogue uh, tradition. And so it's at least that part of what we are, uh, what we do on Sundays that I will be uh, talking about today. I have a wonderful quote from one of my favorite uh, liturgical scholars, Alexander Schmemann, uh, when he writes concerning the liturgy of the word. The word, he says, is as sacramental as the sacrament is evangelical. The proclamation of the word is a sacramental act par excellence because it is a transforming act. It transforms the human words of the gospel, of the gospel writers, into the word of God and the manifestation of the kingdom. And it transforms the person who hears the word into a receptacle of the word and a temple of the spirit. So it's with that Eucharistic or sacramental understanding of what we do when we're reading the Bible and what we do when the preacher preaches and when we listen as a congregation um, that I want to speak of today. The liturgy of the word consists of four uh, readings, one from the Old Testament or as in the current Easter season from the book of Acts, a, a psalm, an epistle, and finally a reading from one of the four Gospels. And after the readings uh, comes the sermon, and next week we will talk a little bit more about what follows on from the sermon. So let's begin with the readings. The Anglican Church, along with the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church and many other denominations, follows a three-year system of Sunday Bible readings laid out in what is called the Revised Common Lectionary. So that means today, in our hopefully ecumenical age, most Christians around the world share the same readings or the same lections every Sunday. But this lectionary system of reading actually developed rather slowly. Justin Martyr, who lived in the second century, so it's pretty early on, uh, describing the typical Sunday service of his day, wrote that the priest read as many readings as there was time for. Now, if the interpretation of what there was time for was up to the local priest, it's not really a great surprise that um, the number was soon standardized to three readings and a psalm. By the fourth century, though, the Old Testament lessons slowly in certain places uh, began to be dropped until, uh, as we know, Thomas Cramner, when he was compiling the Book of Common Prayer uh, during the Reformation, um, didn't even include the Old Testament reading in his very biblically aware uh, prayer book. So uh, in the Book of Common Prayer, we only have uh, the two readings, uh, Epistle and Gospel, plus the Psalm. And it wasn't until the liturgical movement of the 1960s that the Old Testament reading was thankfully restored as a central part of our worship, recognizing it as a necessary part of God's plan of salvation. At St. Barnabas, at an ordinary sung Mass on Sunday, the Old Testament and the Epistle are read right here at our beautiful lectionary um, by members of the congregation, while the Gospel is read, or occasionally sung, uh, by the deacon. 
And it's, of course, as I uh, described in the first video, the special ministry of the deacon to bring the word of God into the world. And at St. Barnabas, we treat uh, the deacon's reading of the gospel with a special solemnity. The choir sings this wonderful uh, alleluia or a seasonally appropriate tract while the servers prepare to accompany the gospel down the central aisle of the church. The celebrant, meanwhile, blesses the deacon while passing him the closed gospel book, that beautiful red book that we have. And while the congregation sings a hymn, the gospel procession begins led by the crucifer with the cross. The deacon holds the gospel book aloft for all to see, flanked by acolytes carrying candles representing the light of Christ. And the gospel is in this way carried in solemn procession from the altar into the midst of the people, symbolizing this procession, the descent of God's word from heaven into the world. And as the gospel is introduced in the midst of the people, it is sensed with incense for the word is holy. And after the gospel is read, the book ascends again to the altar where the celebrant kisses it before closing it, a response of love for the word of God. So why all this ceremony? Because we consider the reading of Holy Scripture as part of our sacramental offering to God. It behooves us, therefore, to consider how this Eucharistic context changes how we hear, how we receive, and how we understand the words. We can and we ought to study the Bible in the privacy of our own homes or together in Bible study groups with other faithful people. And we can treat, and it's good to treat at times, the Bible as an object of scholarship. But when we read the Bible as part of our worship, something new and something different uh, occurs. God transforms the words we speak into his holy and life-giving word, present with us present for us. And we can hear in that language, in the language of presence, uh, the Eucharistic context of the whole of our worship. So after the readings, of course, comes the sermon, which the uh, homilist or um, the preacher does from the, um, the pulpit. The sermon, which also comes, of course, from Judaism and the synagogue tradition. The sermon teaches, but it's not the same as a lecture. It is also an act of worship and part of the whole of our service of worship. It is rather an offering, or it is also an offering, not only of the preacher, but of the whole church, preacher and congregation, and in fact, the whole of the whole body of the, church, of the one body of the church. So this means that the sermon, more than an exposition of wisdom or something like that, every sermon is essentially an exercise in listening. The preacher and congregation listening together, waiting together, on God's word. The preacher's words, therefore, are not so much a mode of talking or a mode of speech as they are a mode of listening, of waiting to be addressed. Because in the sermon we offer, the preacher offers his own words to God's, his or her own words to God's, and the, the congregation offers its own perception and understanding in the hope that God will transform these human words into his own word for us. So that every sign is, every word is the sign of an infinitely more meaningful, full to overflowing word. 
And when the scriptures are read, when the word is preached, the Holy Spirit gives Christ to be sacramentally present here and now to us and for his whole people. At St. Barnabas, after the sermon, we keep a period of silence, and that silence is a time, of course, for reflection, but more importantly, it is a sign of our waiting for the Holy Spirit to work in us as individuals and in us as the whole body. So I'm going to stop um, there, and next week we will move on to the Creed and the rest of the um, liturgy of the word. But before I do, let me just offer you a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. <laughs>